Now, the world is losing the race to meet its climate change goals. That at least is according to the president of the upcoming COP28 climate summit. Sultan al Jaber made those comments as African heads of state gathered in Kenya to discuss exactly how they're going to fund the continent's climate change agenda. That grim assessment also comes just three days before the United Nations publishes its first global stock take. Essentially, it's an assessment of how countries around the world are doing in their efforts to deal with climate change. The world is losing the race to secure the goals of the Paris Agreement. And the world is struggling to keep 1.5 within reach. Collectively, we must admit that we are not delivering the results we need in the time we need them. The Abu Dhabi Fund for Development, Etihad, Credit Insurance, Masdar, the Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, and EMEA Power will join with Africa 50 as a strategic partner under the guidance of the UAE and African leadership to develop 15 gigawatt of clean power by 2030. And by working together, we will deploy 4.5 billion US dollars that will catalyze at least an additional 12.5 billion US dollars from multilateral public and private sources. All right, then we've spoken about energy policy, but what about agriculture? Let's dive into the details on that in a bit more detail. Enoch Chikava is the interim director of the Agricultural Development Unit at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. is joining us on the program tonight. Thank you very much for your time this evening, sir. So a majority of sub-Saharan economies are forecast to see average temperature rises of around two degrees between 2025 and 2040. Assuming we do stay on that path, and it certainly seems like it at this point, how will that affect average crop yields or the staples we have across the continent, especially with respect to cassava, maize and wheat? So, I mean, uh, yield reductions were already in progress. Uh, latest information shows that from 1961 to 2015, productivity at global level has reduced by 20%. But again, those are global averages. You take that into Sub-Saharan Africa. That 20%, which is the global level, is 40% for Africa. And then as we continue on this trajectory, we are going to see yields being decimated uh, even to the lowest level. Right now, the, uh, the import gap, which is to the tune of almost 35 to $40 billion, it means that will increase even double. That's why we need a radical way of uh, coming up with innovation that is needed today in order to continue productivity growth in spite of droughts, pests, and diseases. And that's what the foundation does. You know, we are working with organization like the CG system, which is uh, mainly headquartered here on the African continent to focus on indigenous crops like cassava, millet, sorghum, sweet potato, because these are the crops that are natural to the African continent, rather than focusing on certain foods where we don't have an advantage of growing them. That's why when uh, Russia and Ukraine crisis started, uh, we started to have a reverberation of, uh, of food shortages because they are depending on very long value chains. But we believe we have a unique moment to start to bolster research into, into the improvement of the local uh, foods uh, here on the African continent. And we are working with the CG system and we already have innovations already. And I can give you a few of those uh, those innovations that are ready to go, but they need more resources to scale them. Right. And, and let's, have... let's, let's talk about seeds in a bit more detail here, because as you rightly point out, we need seeds that can handle higher heat loads, a lot more water stress. They're desperately needed, right, up and down the continent. But how should governments then approach a question of ownership of the IP that goes into making these new 
seed varieties so that seed access is not entirely dependent on whether or not farmers can actually pay for them? A lot of the uh, seeds right now developed under the CG, they're all public material. And there's no IP for all the cassava that is produced right now in Ibadan, uh, headquartered in Nigeria, and operating in all cassava-eating countries. It, it, all that is public, and there's no IP around it. The sorghum, the millet, the sweet potato that I was talking about. All this, that's why philanthropy works with the public sector. Uh, at global level, it is the CG. At national level, it is the National Agricultural Research Organizations. And every country has it. So that's why uh, all our work is to come up with innovations for smallholder farmers, and there's no IP around it. Are governments pouring enough money into, into this vital agricultural research? Because it does seem, looking at the way governments tend to spend money, priorities tend to be more on infrastructure and agriculture, healthcare and so on. They tend to get a much smaller slice of government spending. Do we need to increase the amount of cash that's being directed towards agricultural research, especially as far as crops are concerned? Well, I mean, it's one of the key issues that we have been highlighting here at this summit is that the energy and the focus and the agency that we are placing on mitigation, we need the same energy because the changes are exponential. You can't have an incremental response to an, to an exponential threat. So we need the governments of Africa and also even the governments in other developed world to focus on research and development, particularly for the crops where people call food. This business of eating what you don't produce and producing what you don't eat is, is, is perilous. I was talking to the leaders today to say, you know what? Africa now is producing dessert for other people. You are producing cocoa and I have nothing against cocoa, but I'm saying it should not be at the expense of what you call food. You are producing coffee. I have nothing against coffee. But no one can have chocolate for lunch and dinner or coffee for lunch and dinner. And then you have subcontracted other people to produce the main dish for you. You are eating rice, which you are not producing. You are eating bread, which you are not producing. So that's where we need a radical shift in terms of what can we do for ourselves. That means even the governments of Africa putting more money into the research and development of the crops they call food where they are. And right. that is where we want to partner with them. Okay, then. And, and that leads me to my next question, because assuming African economies can only focus on two adaptation strategies, because they're dealing with other economic problems at the same time. Currencies up and down the continent have weakened fairly sharply. The Zimbabwean dollar, for example, down around 400% uh, and more. Here in Kenya, where we are, uh, the Kenyan shilling has lost around 19% of its value. In Nigeria, massive adjustment on the Naira. So resources are very, very tight. So if we're only going to focus on two things that we can fund with our domestic resources, from your perspective, what would they be and why? So I would say two things. One, I think we need innovations in crops and livestock. As I said, in the core crops, because that is what you call food, and you need to take charge of what you eat every time. And again, there are you know, proven returns on investment here. Every dollar you put in the public research, like the CG and the National Agricultural Research uh, Stations, you are getting $10 in terms of the return. It's proven. We have worked on that. So that works. And we know we have the innovations and then we need to scale them. The second one is around the soil health and amending the, de the, de the degraded soils. African soils are so poor, it's one of the oldest soils in the world. But in order for it to keep on raising productivity, when the temperatures are going up and also when your rainfall is short, you need to deeply understand your soil so that it's no longer trial and error. Year after year, you try a crop, it doesn't work. So right now, we have reduced that cost of understanding your soil. Every country can come up with a national soil information system. That cost has been reduced by 97% in the past uh, 10 years through our work. 
So every country can do a digital soil map and they can get about 20 characteristics of your soil. That is powerful in terms of making the right decisions. You know you're putting your money in a value chain that will do well. And it is like an insurance against what you're putting down on the ground. With Africa still being 95% rain-fed agriculture, obviously, irrigation is very important, but it is going to take time. We need to start to manage every drop of rain that we are having uh, on the continent. That starts with deeply understanding your soil. The tools are here, even the crops and livestock uh, innovations, they are right here. We just need to make sure that governments are putting that into the policies. That's the third thing. You need to plan, right. you need to prioritize, and you need to focus on what you can achieve in the shortest possible time. All right, we'll leave it there for the time being. Fingers crossed, governments are listening. Enok Chikawa there, Interim Director, Agricultural Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you.